could already just start going to open. Everybody get a chance to look at executive decision, session minutes. Okay. I guess if they're okay, we'll return them then. And we do have a couple of things to talk about in the pre-meeting. Um, purchase of seven Zoll Auto Pulse systems, Carter. Mr. Mayor, thank, thank you. you. That is a um, a sole source purchase and uh, not inconsistent with conversation that we've had with you in the past as it relates to similar type equipment. That probably would have been with the previous council, however, and so we want to be sure that uh, you understood what that purchase is all about, what that recommendation is all about. And so I ask um, Chief Griswold here to walk us through that a little bit and uh, entertain any questions that you might have. This evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, again, thank you for your time, Mayor's Member of Council. Uh, on tonight's agenda, Minute Action is uh, one of the fire department's capital projects for the Zoll Auto Pulse. This is an automated CPR device that provides mechanical compressions for patients in cardiac arrest. Um, specific to the Zoll Auto Pulse, um, we are recommending the purchase of that unit over the competitor for a few reasons. Namely, the, des the design of this unit is really uh, effective for where we care for our patients in the field, namely pre-hospital, pre-ambulance. Um, the Zoa Hoddle Pulse is, um, has an integrated backboard, and, and, and what that does for us <coughs> is the competitor's model, you have to put them on their unit and then uh, strap the patient to a six-foot backboard. Our auto pulse that we're recommending has an integrated backboard, it's a shorter backboard, and then it has what's called a life band that goes over the patient's chest. This life band then compresses, it's called circumferential chest compressions, compresses the whole chest cavity. Think about squeezing a sponge rather than pushing that sponge with one finger. Um, the competitors is more of a, a plunger type in the center of a chest, uh, more modeling a human being doing chest compressions. This does a circumferential chest compression which their literature, literature tells you produces more flow of blood. This is important to us in the field because as a fire department, we're typically first on scene with those patients. Early CPR is the best thing we can do for those patients followed by early defibrillation. Um, to the point where even now they're teaching hands-only CPR because circu or circulating that oxygenated blood is critical to that patient's survival. So this shortened backboard, and then it has a soft part, but it allows us, again, in that pre-hospital setting, to go upstairs, downstairs, in between cars, with compressions never stopping. Uh, currently, when we have a firefighter giving those compressions, you're going up there, upstairs, downstairs, you're stopping those com compressions for um, however long it takes us to get back out where, a, where a, a firefighter can then get above that board as we're carrying them out to the ambulance. So this automated machine produces that. Um, lastly, uh, the, the, with the life band and the backboard, it's low profile. The other unit has basically picture an arc, or arch over the patient with a motor head and then that plunger that comes down. It becomes real top heavy. It can creep off the center of that patient's chest down to their belly, thus ineffective compressions. Um, so we really feel this is the best unit for our firefighters to provide the best care. In, in, in the setting that they work. The other, other reason is this Zoll Auto Pulse is interoperable with our Zoll Cardiac monitors that we purchased last year. Um, they, they speak to each other, so as soon as we hit that, hook that up, we get a CPR display on that cardiac monitor that also tells us the heart rhythm and makes sure that we're producing good compressions, we can stop it, it sees that, and mo uh, real importantly, it allows us to track that patient care throughout that whole cardiac arrest. And what that does for us is we can pull that data, time-stamped data, and really evaluate, hey, we had the auto pulse on within three minutes, we had our first shock within four minutes, and we can start to identify trends on, on where we're really having the best success rate with cardiac patients. It's a very brief description of our request. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Carter had a question first, and then we'll get to you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief. What I recall, too, is that there was a lot of uh, consistency with regard to what the uh, EMTs at the hospital are using as well. Is that true, or do I remember incorrectly? A little bit incorrect, Mayor, members of council. 
the consistency is with our Zoll cardiac monitors. Both agencies operate the Zoll cardiac monitors, and that is imp important. Now, the hospital does have a competitor's device. It's, it's, it's the plunger type. Um, it's not as big of a deal for us because we can transfer this unit, we can train with the ER and everything as well. The cardiac monitor is consistent. They're both Zoll units. We're recommending this, coal, this Zoll auto pulse because we just believe it's a better unit in the field for the fire service. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Carter asked a very brilliant question that covered part of what I wanted to know. But uh, I, I trust that the hospital arrives, they're not going to take your unit off, put their unit on, and do all that sort of stuff. So I know I'm asking you to speak for them and what they do, but can you? Yeah, can Mayor, Member of Council, that? we've had preliminary conversations with their ambulance manager, and that wouldn't be in the best interest of the patient. Mm -hmm. These incidents, as much as we want to keep our units in area, these are those patients where minutes do matter, and this is worth letting them take our auto pulse into the ER, removing it in the ER, when they would remove it anyways, and either transfer it to another unit when they get it on, on another, another device. Um, so we would, uh, again, develop within our protocol, within our procedures, to allow that to happen. Yeah, it, it's, it's about patient yeah. care. I mean, we really believe this unit produces the best compressions, and stopping that for any reason would be unreasonable. Yeah, I'm so. just concerned about them in the field. Oh, well, we got to take yours off and put ours on that. But, you know, it, it's a preliminary discussions we've had, mayor, members, and councils, and, you, and you, I think we'll get easy agreement on that, best interest of the patients. I don't expect we'll run into that, but we've yet to formalize a lot of those procedures. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Ken? <clears throat> uh, I guess two questions. One. Um, is it one size fits all? Will it be able to adapt from a little child to uh, a 300, 400 pound man, gal, whatever? But I mean, will it be able to adapt? Um, Mayor, members of council, I, I don't want to speak definitively on the child because CPR and children, especially mm -hmm. automated, I, I'd want to follow up with you on that. As far as adult pe people, most of the time our cardiac arrests are on adults, but we, we have had children, unfortunately. Yes, it is adaptable, and it's one of the unique features of that life band. What it does is it, it, it provides, a, it calculates the size, shape, and the resistance of the patient's chest, because a bigger guy, it's, it's all about compressing that chest a certain amount in order to compress that heart. It's smart CPR, so when you hook the machine up, that life band sucks to its chest, and then it calculates resistance, size, and all that stuff. Speaking for adults, I would want to follow up as far as its effectiveness with children, we don't see that near as often, but I don't I don't know that to tell you definitively right okay. now. Just I was curious, and then good question. If I may, Mayor, um, the funding for this, where are we looking at it coming from? Mr. Mayor, Councilman, it, it, it's all budgeted, so it, it's within their equipment purchases and, uh, and purchases we anticipate. Okay. It was a one set sixteen project. One set sixteen. Yes, okay. Sir. If I understand correctly, the main reason for having this presentation is because we're going with sole source rather than the normal process. So the budgeting and everything else is taken care of. Right. Okay. Other questions for Chief Griswold? Are we all okay with the sole source purchase? Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hurry up and get. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <here. Yes. laughs> oh, the 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 it's a big one. <laughs> the the I have already <laughs> it. Man, it so makes a lot of sense. Get the reallocation of funds from the reservoir upgrade project to the CY booster station replacement project. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, uh, th this is one of those items that <laughs> I just wanted to make double sure you understood and were aware of in that we are talking about $500,000, but we're also talking about two very significant uh, projects in our utility system. And so um, I wanted to take the opportunity to go over this a little bit with you, make sure um, that if you had lingering questions, we could take that direction, if you will, and uh, adjust accordingly. Um, much of this will be familiar to you because we did talk about a lot of this during the capital process back in May uh, and maybe even earlier April potentially but um, w with respect to 
why the booster station is going to need a little more money and why we can wait on the reservoir project is really what I want you to be comfortable with. And so if I could, Mr. Mayor, defer to Andrew to kind of walk us through that, I think that'd be helpful. Mr. Mayor, Council, you have heard most recently about the um, 10 million gallon reservoir and how that project is kind of on hold pending the results of the 2020 water master plan. We don't know if we need 10 million gallons up there or not. We may be downsize that to 5 million and that will have a drastic effect on how, what that project costs. So until that study is done, we don't really know what we're going to really do with that 10 million gallon reservoir. We've got 3.5 million though budgeted for the 10 million gallon reservoir this fiscal year. The CY Booster Station project was a project that was started back in 2016, and we originally estimated that project at roughly 1.3 million. During detailed design by our consultant, we got uh, some differential soils there that require, instead of a spread footer foundation, we're going to now go with drill piers. We've also got a vintage 16-inch water main of the same age, roughly 65 years old, that. We in hindsight, we should have included with that initial estimate. But now, if we're doing the booster station, it makes sense to replace that 500 feet of 65, 66 year old water main at the same time. Combined, that now raises the construction cost from our estimated one point, just over 1. million to 1.5 million. So we're looking to allocate 500,000 from the 10 million gallon reservoir to the CY booster station project, just so that we have enough money in the, in the copper to get that project up and running. Just out of curiosity. What are you saying, Okay. One other thing, we are anticipating, you know, once we get bids, we are going to go back to our funding agency, which is the Wyoming Water Development Commission, and see if they want to pony up some additional grant funding for this project. So hopefully that 500000 won't be all of one cent money that was allocated to the uh, 10 million gallon reservoir. Mike? Uh, just out of curiosity, where is the CY Booster Station? It, it, is, it was by the old CY Junior High, which is now... Whatever it is. Journey. Is it Journey? Thank you, yeah. Councilman. It's now Journey, so it's kind of behind Smith's okay. up in that... No, okay, it's I visible. Can. I mean, you can see that you can see the, the tank right by it. People don't usually understand that building right by it, but that building is the, uh, yeah, is okay. the Booster That's Station. Just curious. Thank you. Questions for Andrew? reallocation do we have any concerns so we'll uh, hopefully replenish that fund if we do need all of that money for the 10 million gallon reservoir <coughs> and, and again right now that's kind of a crapshoot depending on the 2020 water master plan as to what exactly we're going to have to do with that facility but I'll see if, if, it, if it needs three and a half million we'll have to come up with another 500,000 for that project two ways off it is it's we'll have a lot better feeling when that master plan is complete towards the end of um, uh, beginning of next year sometime. Okay. This year. All right. Everybody okay? All right. Good enough. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, anything on tonight's agenda that people had questions about or concerns? Uh, Mike? Mr. Mayor, I had a couple of questions, but uh, drawn set me straight on them. So. And I, it's my understanding that some of the people who were most concerned about the parade ordinance have uh, since agreed to its terms and its language. So, uh, now John, I know that you did some hard work on trying to deal with the whole business of demonstrations and, and uh, people having the right to free speech in public places. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about doing that work? And we'll probably have you do the same thing in the meeting itself so people understand some of these changes that were made before this meeting. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. Mayor, Council, I don't understand process, but I think the, the last uh, couple of weeks, some additional research actually came across a really pretty interesting Tenth Circuit case. It's the I Matter case. It involves a couple of protest groups down in Utah. It went to the Tenth Circuit, a panel of three decided the case, and it really <coughs> gave some pretty good guidance on what's expected here in the Tenth Circuit, which includes one commission. So basically, um, we added some provisions in there um, talking about uh, alternatives, because that's a big thing. If you, uh, if you can't protest in some way, well, you have some meaningful alternatives. And 
can't go protest at the park today because we already have scheduled uh, a big family function up there. Well, we have some meaningful alternatives. Well, in this case, we actually have a couple of parks that would be available for kind of an ad hoc uh, pedestrian parade, demonstration, worship, gathering, whatever. Or we have alternatives, too, that you can go to uh, government buildings, uh, use the sidewalks around those, schools, use the sidewalks around those. So if you add up all of the schools and government buildings and office buildings uh, here in, in uh, Casper, you have really you know, scores, I think, of, uh, of alternative places to go protest. And a couple of those are the parks, being Conwell and City Park, have a lot of visibility. So that's an important thing. <coughs> The thing that we originally had was the appeal process, and really a very timely appeal process, uh, both for the approval as well as then for the appeal to you. And so again, that provides a, a, a great alternative to people, because then we get to hear the actual facts, why it's important that this happened fast, how big it is, you know, and we have the constraints upon the budgets of the people involved. So that's really a huge factor. And I think one of the biggest factors going in favor of our ordinance of being compliant with the Constitution. In addition, uh, we included uh, an indigency provision in the special events guide, which uh, I think is probably uh, a little avant-garde. It may be required at some point, but uh, it really doesn't seem to be required uh, uh, in looking at the cases throughout the country. So certainly some people have talked about it, it's been advocated for. But we actually have a provision here whereby that, you know, if, if you want to protest and you don't think that the, uh, the parks are adequate, you don't think that marching around the government buildings are adequate, and you're an indigent person, well, you still ought to be able to express your views and, and uh, go and have a protest. And so we've actually had a provision for that with certain uh, guidelines, which are, again, objectively stated as opposed to just uh, the, uh, the happenstance of some, uh, someone, an administrator, making a decision on that. So again, that's part of the, uh, the constitutional requirements. And of course, we did early on make the uh, put in with specificity when a, a, a parade or trade permit should be granted and then when it shouldn't be granted. Again, trying to set forth some specificity so that it can't be too uh, too subjective as to which group does or doesn't get a parade permit. Uh, in addition, um, we said that if there's a contemporary event, you also have an opportunity to, to have an uh, ad hoc type of gathering. You don't have to go through the parade permit process. Again, that was something that was kind of bothering me. Well, you know, if you have some, something bad happen at one of the high schools and you want to get together, or you have something you want to celebrate. You know, you don't want to have to go <coughs> to get a permit. So we uh, put that in the ordinance as well. So uh, uh, finally, though, <coughs> this is what the, the I uh, Matter case really was a surprising to me, was the, uh, the fact that the insurance, they, they talked about it, they talked about one aspect of it, and that is the aspect that, well, you're, you're requiring these people to uh, buy insurance, but you're going to be the beneficiary of that insurance. We don't think that you, as the beneficiary of the city, and the government, should in, in make somebody else pay for your insurance. And uh, if they don't pay for that, then potentially they would be able to exercise their rights of free speech. So we've taken that out of there that we would be an additional insured on that insurance policy, uh, though for certain activities, you know, if you're just running on our facilities or whatever, and there can be cords out there, whatever people can trip on, and that's something else. But for things of this nature, um, we, we would still have them have insurance, but it would really be to protect uh, the participants. And you've seen that all around the country, whether you have people up there and they're tripping over cords or whether they're you know, going to a garlic festival. But so uh, with that, we, we decided we really have our own insurance. We don't need to do that. And to be consistent uh, with the Tenth Circuit, we've said, well, we don't have to have, be named insured. There's an additional insured on your insurance policy. But we do want you to have insurance to protect the people that are going to be participating. So again, if there's an agency question, we can take care of that too. So those are kind of the, the big changes I think that we've made since we last met. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on that if you like. Mike? The, the issue of the additional in, of the city being a named insured, that is, is that only changed with reference to the free speech kind of demonstrations, or is that did you change that with reference to the whole parade business? I, I think we're going to include it in the whole parade because, you know, whether you're out um, speaking, signage, chanting, marching, uh, you know, those, those are uh, difficult. What is or is not free speech? And a lot of times just being there uh, under 
under certain circumstances might be considered free speech under the Constitution. So we've, we've eliminated that basically for any type of parade uh, that would be on, on, on yeah, this any type kind of, of parade thing. demonstration. Demonstration. Blah, blah, blah. blah. That type of thing. Yes, sir. Other questions? But it's, it's very clear that content and purpose will not factor in to the permit granting process. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I'm I sure mean, all of us would have problems with one type of protest versus another, depending on our views, but it's irrelevant. Correct. Right. Okay. Any other questions for John? So you'd be comfortable doing the same thing out on the floor, I hope, so the public can understand these they changes. Have to, of course. I think we want to clarify that this is about free speech. And so, uh, when you said the, the city's quote other insurance, that would just be a claim against Warm or like any other Correct. claim against the city. Correct. Okay. okay. We all okay? Uh, any questions? All right. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, anything else on the agenda that's a concern? Okay. A um, couple things then. Um, we will have an executive session next week to talk about land acquisition. Um, following, so we'll have to we'll have to schedule a special meeting as we've done before, and then do the executive session and then close the special meeting. We'll do that after the work session. And uh, let's see, um, item 11A9, the Hogadan MOU. The Hogadan folks are still working on the language and are not ready to sign the MOU the way it was written. So we're just going to pull that from the agenda. So um, when we get to that section, I'll just call for a motion to uh, pull 11A9 off the agenda until the Hogadon folks um, and our, our staff can come up with it. And this, of course, is all about how we're handling the operating of the lighting system and who pays for that and how that all lay, uh, plays out. So. And then, so then, and then we'll go on to the rest, pass the rest of the consent of the agenda items. So, anything else? To so, on that? so, Mr. Mayor, I guess what I would recommend along those lines is taking a motion to pull it off consent because right now it's being considered under consent, and then considering the remaining items on the consent agenda, and then potentially passing a motion if council sees fit to potentially table oh, okay. this uh, this item, okay. and. Um, I would say no later than the first meeting in November, first business meeting in November, Tim, if that sounds right. Yeah, they were thinking around the 15th, so. Okay. So let's just push it to, if we could, Mr. Mayor, to the first meeting in November for a date certain, at which point we would bring it off the table, bring it back for regular consideration, and hopefully pass it all. All right, so this could be one of the times where the Vice Mayor has to kick me in the leg and <laughs> make sure we cover all of those things. Okay. <laughs> all right. Is that the appropriate Robert's way of doing it is just removing it and then Take bringing it back up. That, that certainly, uh, Mr. Mayor <coughs> Council, and I'd recommend it seems to be the well, cleanest and what most would be in essence tabling it. Would it be better to have a motion to table that? that or, uh, and just table it and be done with it. Table it to a date certain. Or that, that's exactly what I'm proposing. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. But it has to come off consent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has to pull it off consent to, first. We have to make a motion to pull it off consent, consent before we can take it. Then a motion to Oh, okay. Table. You got it. You got it. Okay. Council will have to be happy. And um, <laughs> we, uh, we have some business uh, to discuss regarding the police station. And we don't have time for that in our current work session agenda. We have five Tuesdays in October, and I'd like to get a sense of who, who, who. <laughs> other, other than Councilman Kathy, who's already made this stance He's known. for joy. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand, elk season opens the 15th <laughs> and goes to the 31st. <laughs> and I'm already missing opening day. I believe you guys had an effective work session last week without me and two other people. So, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that information can still be, but uh, 
I guess I'd you just bet. like to see if the majority would be willing to come in on the 29th for a special work session. You can fill my tag. Actually, I told Vicki I'd take her out of town that week. Well, if you have internet service, you can That's watch worse. the meeting just like I did. So, okay. So we will have a work session on the 29th. That being the only item on the on the uh, agenda. General So I think we've got everything covered here. Uh, just got a couple minutes. Um, tomorrow, Carter and I will be talking with the developers at the Coffee Talk on our trip to DC. And uh, since we've only got a couple minutes here, can't say a whole lot. So if anybody wants to know more about it, you could come at 7 a.m. <laughs> tomorrow and hear our presentation. Um, it was a very productive trip. Um, I, I said several times during the course of this, it's just, it just uh, reinforces what I've always known is that there's no substitute for face-to-face -face visits. And so we were able to meet with all three members of our delegation and their staff and we talked uh, about the uh, grant application we have already submitted to complete the Midwest Avenue project, uh, which we currently don't have a funding mechanism for, um, and it's a critical piece of our infrastructure to uh, complete the uh, travel route from the interstate all the way to our downtown and the state office building, and, um, and, and so we believe that we've uh, received a higher level of support than maybe we've received in the past for similar grants. And, um, and, and then we also, uh, I think, put a face to the uh, application with the Department of Transportation. And so I think we've increased the likelihood that we will, we will be approved for that $1.9 million grant request. And then similar things happened with the Mills Project that you may have read about in the paper today. Uh, the, there are some abandoned mine land fund fund money available for that since it was a quarry at one time. And um, and so that those federal funds are uh, available and they're applying for that. Um, then we also have some EPA funds with uh, continued work on the brownfields that uh, is critical because you can't develop land that has uh, potentially, potentially been contaminated without going through a very prescriptive uh, analysis that has to be conducted um, and, uh, and getting those uh, phase one and phase two assessments done basically makes some of that land available for development when it wasn't before. And so we, we were able to get a lot done in a very short period of time. Our consultants were, that was one of the best decisions we've made was to contribute that $10,000 that we contributed toward the hiring of the consultants <coughs> along with CADA and the county and uh, they guided us through that process, set up all the meetings, um, they knew the lay of the land, uh, they got us through security, and basically made it possible for get, us to get all this done. So I don't, I don't know if you want to add anything for a minute or two before we go out there, so, but uh, it was uh, worthwhile, and I think, we, I think we did a good job as a team representing the community. So, okay. That's it, I guess. What? Uh, Mr. Okay. Mayor, can I just have about a half a minute here? Please. You know, I just want to recognize that all the staff members here that are here for these meetings, I want you to know that I appreciate that you guys are taking time away from your home and, and that kind of thing. Because I remember <coughs> when I was a little kid and my dad had to come to all of these meetings and all the, the stuff that we missed at home. I just want you guys all to know that I appreciate that and I recognize the sacrifices that you guys make uh, you know, as quote, part of your job. Uh, I, I just, as I kind of looked around, I just thought that was important to recognize with you guys. Well said. Her, her. Anybody argue with that?
I now declare the October 1, 2019 regular council meeting to order. Would council members please denote your presence by depressing your yes switch. All council members are present. And again, a reminder that our meeting can be viewed on cable channel 192. Would anyone care to come to the podium and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Some brave soul. Any takers tonight? I guess not, so I'll do it. Oh, come on up. The news guy. All right, good man. Name, name please again. What's up? Name please. Dodge Landisman. Thank Just want to say hi, I'm a new reporter for uh, K2. Okay. So I figure I'd say hello. Um, all right, and we just recite the Pledge of Allegiance? You just start us. Okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> I almost, almost struck out for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Chair would entertain a motion to approve by minute action the minutes of the September 17, 2019 regular council meeting as published in the Casper Star Tribune on September 28, 2019. So moved. Second. Sec moved by Councilman Bates, seconded by Vice Mayor Johnson. Any amendments to those minutes? Now please cast your vote and please record the vote. All members voting aye, motion passed. Chair would entertain a motion to approve by minute action the minutes of the September 17th, 2019 executive session. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Cap uh, Hopkins, seconded by Councilman Friel. Any amendments to those minutes? If not, please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. Chair would entertain a motion to approve by minute action the October 1st, 2019 bills and claims as audited by City Manager Napier. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Mayor Johnson, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. Any abstentions? If not, please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. Now is the time we invite anyone to the audience who wishes to speak with the council to come forward. If you're here to speak on any of, the, any of the items that we already have scheduled for a public hearing, I would ask for you to wait until we get to that section. Uh, but if you're here to speak on any other matter, please come forward. And as stated on the first page, we ask you to state your name and address. Please address your questions to me, and please no attacks on staff or council, and keep your remarks to five minutes, please. Is anyone here to speak to council? Good evening. Good evening again. Dennis Steensland, 533 South Washington. Uh, I'm not going to harp on the money angle of the Plains Furniture thing tonight because I'm sure you've all had plenty of time to study it and know where the money's coming from and going to. But uh, what I would like to do is, is last council meeting, Mayor Powell asked the attorney how if the city could help anybody in the berm taking down their trees? And the answer was no, you cannot. And I relate that to the Plains Furniture deal. We have a bid, it's not apples to apples, but it's how do you help one contractor buy a building for little or no money in my opinion against people that have bought property for double the money or praise price. And I guess the other thing that I did find out looking through it, uh, the north parking lot, it didn't appear to me like it was in the highlighted area for anything that was up for sale. So uh, I don't feel like that should be a part of any bid or any, any deal that we've got going with uh, Daigle and, and Howley. Uh, I think that's... Uh, a valuable piece that the city can do, and if a city doesn't do it, it's a valuable piece for Ashby or John Huff. Uh, so I don't know how it got into the proposal for for their bid for the other property. But anyway, uh, I've said it two or three times, uh, we've had an extra month to talk about this. Uh, 
I still feel like you're using $2 million of taxpayer money to get a, a project moving forward, which we're all for. I would like to see it move forward, but I, I just cannot uh, grasp the idea that we would, we would sell it for that much less than the property is worth. And I still think it's worth that, and I, I think it will be worth that in the future. How long we want to sit on it, I don't have any idea. But, uh, but anyway, that's my concerns, and uh, I've got one more meeting to, to harp on it. So <laughs> I hope you've all looked at the numbers. Uh, like I said one time, four or five were here when it first took place, the three million idea. Uh, and then we put money into it since then. So. Uh, the new ones, I hope they've studied the numbers and know that uh, that's a lot of taxpayers' dollars to, uh, to put away. So thanks for your time. Any questions for Mr. Steensland? I'm sorry. Okay. Anyone else here to speak this evening? With Mr. Steensland, with the permission of counsel, I intend to preface the public hearing with an explanation of the sequence of events and the decisions and the reasoning behind those decisions that eventually brought us to the place that we're at as we consider this bit. And you will have a chance to, you may not agree with all of that, all of those decisions, but they were made at the time that they were made. So you can look forward to that. I can't say, if I can only speak for myself, so no. So, okay, no, is anyone else here to speak on other matters? Okay, all right, please read the consent agenda items, or excuse me, consent agenda titles. Establishing October 15th, 2019 as the public hearing date for the consideration of the following two items. A zone change of 1.65 acres described as Tract A, Garden Creek Square Edition from Plan Unit Development to General Business. And the transfer of location for Retail Liquor License Number 19, Ridley's Family Market Incorporated, doing business as Ridley's Family Market from 1375 CY Avenue to 3037 CY Avenue. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion to, by minute action, establish the public hearing dates just read. Second. Moved by Councilman Cathy, seconded by Councilman Friel. Any abstentions or nay votes? Please cast your vote and please record the vote. All members voting aye. Motion passed. I now declare the public hearing open for the consideration of amendment to Chapter 10.72 regarding parades. Mr. City Attorney, do you have exhibits? Thank you, we have one exhibit tonight, Mayor. Exhibit number one corresponds from John Henley and Fleur Tremel to Jay Carter Napier dated September 25, 2019. Thank you. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, as you recall, the original impetus with regard to uh, staff reviewing this ordinance was with regard to the uh, discrepancies, if you will, between some of the language in the special events guide and some of the stipulation in the ordinances. Staff has been working with council to try to rectify those discrepancies, if you will, and have uh, presented for you tonight or ready for you tonight, uh, consider a revision regarding some of those discrepancies. Furthermore, however, the city attorney has been undertaking a number of other revisions that have come in response to some of the community input and, uh, and I would suggest our, our very appropriate, worthwhile, and meaningful revisions that if it pleases the council, I would like to defer to the attorney for a brief description of those issues. That have to do with free speech and yep. the right, right of assembly. Mr. Henley, could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you changed uh, based on those concerns? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council. Um, as you know, the uh, the parade permit started off very broadly, and uh, but as part of that, uh, you know, anytime you have a gathering, you have the potential for some type of free speech, whether it be a gathering of uh, to celebrate uh, some religious event, to, uh, to to come together to mourn, to uh, protest something uh, on the public uh, agenda. Um, 
So in looking at that, uh, and in looking at the case law surrounding that, uh, there are a variety of, of uh, concerns that have arisen over the years. Um, and so the, the point of the, the ordinance, the point of the cases, is to make sure that governments don't get in the way of the citizens in exercising their rights of free speech, but recognizing also that government has a responsibility to other citizens. You can't shut down the entire uh, city government, uh, the city center, by protesting in the middle of a main street just because you want to protest that the, the, the daisies weren't the state flower this year as opposed to some other flower. So there's, there's a certain balancing there. Um, in order that we um, uh, follow the, the constitutional guidelines, though, which has happened through uh, common law, there are a lot of things that are kind of the hallmarks. One is that if the government's going to say uh, you need to, uh, you can't uh, protest here, you have to have alternative places to protest or to march or to gather or to pray. And so in, in looking at that, um, we've included in the ordinance the opportunity now for people just to gather without even getting a parade permit, just to go to either um, City Park or Conwell Park, both have high visibility, both are uh, often there, so long as there's no other gatherings there, no other gatherings that have been reserved there. Similarly, uh, as far as uh, 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 government office buildings, uh, the sidewalks adjacent to those, or schools, the sidewalks adjacent to those, they were all available without even going or seeking a parade permit. Um, and again, this simply gives people an opportunity if there's something that comes up uh, contemporaneously, you don't want to have to go uh, and, and uh, get a particular permit. Um, you can still go out and you can gather, you can uh, uh, associate with those who have similar beliefs, uh, you, can, uh, do, you can pray, you can protest, however you want to do that. So that's one of the main things in looking at the, uh, the, uh, the Constitution, an alternative place that you can protest and, and express your views. Um, consistent with that, too, is that um, the, the government shouldn't be putting something in place that would be uh, subjectively uh, an obstacle for people to, uh, to gather and express themselves. So therefore, we've included a very detailed list, which was uh, basically taken from a United States Supreme Court case as to when uh, parade permits could uh, be granted or should be granted and when they could not be granted because there would be some prohibitions there in the, for public safety or the like. So we've included those. Uh, one of the main, uh, I think, uh, very, very excellent provisions in, in the ordinance you have before you is the appeal process, which is so, uh, uh, can happen so quickly when it comes before you and uh, that it would immediately take the, uh, the decision to the body that actually could hear, hear and make the responsibility for it. There's no intermediary appeals. It would go immediately to you as the hearing body on that, and you could act upon it quickly. And uh, so I, I think that is just a, a fantastic provision, and one that uh, really gives a lot of assurance to the public that they can come in and basically have that free speech before you, which is going to get maybe more publicity than they would have gotten had they not been denied the, uh, the, uh, the parade permit in the first place. So, so there's good benefits all the way around with that provision. Um, in addition, uh, one of the provisions that uh, was most recently changed was that involving insurance. We can still require insurance to protect people who might be in the parade or in the vicinity of the parade. Should they get hurt, they should have some effective recourse against those who uh, organize the parade. But the insurance that would be required would not be for the protection of the city of Casper. We would not be a named insured on that, uh, uh, nor would our employees or agents, but the, uh, the, the individuals who would uh, organize the parade, if they were to have uh, committed an, an omission uh, or an act that were negligent, then uh, somebody who was injured would have an effective way to go back and get help and pay their medical bills or something of the like. So um, all of those things, I think, are uh, important, and all of them are there uh, to help uh, assure that people have an opportunity to, uh, to have an effective voice. 
And then the last one, which again I think is probably a little bit uh, cutting edge, would be for uh, people who are indigent. Obviously there are the opportunities, you can just go to the parks, you can go to the government buildings, uh, go to the school buildings and uh, use the sidewalks without any permit at all, or you can go and, and get uh, a parade permit. But for those that wanted to have a little bit bigger parade or have it someplace different, and they needed to go to a parade permit and they had to have some uh, fees potentially ass uh, assessed against them because of the extra manpower or insurance requirements, they can, if they can show they're indigent, they, get, they can have those fees and requirements waived. So again, uh, a very, I think, uh, 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 it provides a good opportunity for people who want to come in and uh, express themselves publicly. And you're making sure that you are not getting in the way of people having an effective opportunity to express themselves. Okay. Mr. Henley, would we have to suspend our rules if council members had some questions for you regarding the reasoning behind these changes? N no, sir, I don't think you need to do that at all. I, I wonder if we should do that before we get to the public comment, just so everyone understands, because these are major changes to the parade ordinance. And, I'm going to ask the question I asked in the um, pre-meeting, just to clarify. So the, the rules are written in such a way that it would not really be possible for a permit to be denied based on the content or purpose of the demonstration or the protest. That's correct. So you could have uh, you know, people from different uh, political perspectives, and that shouldn't factor in at all. Uh, it's certainly not part of the uh, the criteria, which is enunciated within the parade ordinance itself, and certainly uh, wouldn't be a, a part of the consideration that would go into uh, uh, any of the the decision making of the uh, clerk's office, which is basically ministerial. Though again, there's some objective criteria even uh, in the ministerial aspects of this, such as defining indigency and things of that nature. So again, we try to make it as objective as possible. So this would not be subjective, and it shouldn't make any difference whether your viewpoints are uh, pro-religion, anti-religion, uh, pro-right, pro-left, whatever. Does anybody? I have, I have another question or two, unless someone else has others. So you specifically mentioned two parks that are in the center of the city. I assume that is to prevent the possibility that someone wants to make a public statement and they would be shuffled off to some remote location where no one would know that they were protesting. Actually, the visibility of those parks were, uh, uh, was an important consideration. And, and in that case, obviously, they're uh, on two of the main thoroughfares in the, the city itself. And uh, go ahead, Councilman. Oh, go ahead with this okay. Uh, yeah, I think it was 20 years ago that the people from Westboro Church in Kansas came to Casper to protest Matthew Shepard's funeral, and many people found that very distasteful. This uh, this change would allow for that type of protest to take place. Um, in fact, it, it would, and uh, you know those people could come, and they would have the right to apply for a parade permit. They would have the right to go out. Uh, and protest in front of uh, schools or government uh, office buildings. Um, so again, just because uh, uh, maybe a majority of the city would find certain uh, uh, certain viewpoints uh, inappropriate or distasteful, uh, um, it, they could still nevertheless have their opportunity to express those because of our Constitution. Councilman Huber, do you have a question? Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I do have a couple of questions and concerns about this. Uh, first of all, you're bringing up the uh, issue from uh, right at about 20 years ago now. Uh, that that touches an open nerve on my heart because my, my mother lived right next door to St. Mark. Are we in discussion church. phase or are well, we questioning? No, okay. A, a I'll, I'll, you're right, yeah. That, that was a stressful thing. Oh. Uh, the only problem, and I, I really appreciate the work that the city staff's done on this, but Mr. Henley, I'd kind of like you to comment a little bit about this, uh, uh, taking the city off of being and also insured on these policies. I'm troubled by that because uh, I, I understand that in terms of if it's a city action that causes someone to be injured, then certainly that should be in essence, on the city's dime. But I'm, I'm troubled, and I can easily foresee that one of these 
events could result in a tragedy and then the city gets drug into it and I wonder seriously if we're being uh, faithful to our fiduciary obligation to the city to if if we don't insist that no huh folks uh, you know we want this insurance to also cover the city in case it's not something that the city directly did but it's in essence something that the city allowed you to do if you could comment on that I'd appreciate it. I'll, I'll be happy to and I think that's a it's a valid concern and, and from a practical point of view I, I'm afraid that you are uh, likely right should there be an event uh, oftentimes uh, in litigation um, the the, uh, the deep pocket will be the one that will be brought into the litigation no matter what and so in this case uh, should there be some type of a gathering and uh, the city is requested to let uh, uh, an entity use a public space for their gathering and in the course of that gathering the uh, entity is going to provide their own uh, security or is, is going to be looking to make sure that no one uh, uh, enters that might be a harm to the others and uh, you know if somebody lets their friend in, and lo and behold that friend then d does something uh, uh, injurious to, to other people um, you know, you would say, well, it's the friend who's responsible. It's the entity who let the friend do that that's responsible. But, you know, the fact of the matter is the likelihood really is that the city of Casper would be named as a defendant too. I'm not going to say otherwise. But we do have a case that is pretty clear on that um, uh, coming out of the state of Utah, but it's a Tenth Circuit case, and of course we all have to abide by the Tenth Circuit. And... Um, it was uh, it was probably a little bit more strident than I think a lot of cases in talking about that insurance requirement. So that uh, where we might though put up uh, prior restraint um, for someone exercising their freedom of speech simply to protect our wallet, they found that was uh, an improper uh, Im impediment to the exercise of the, that individual's First Amendment rights. Mr. Mayor, if I might follow up. Well, was that case uh, just narrow as to, uh, in essence, freedom of speech, freedom of expression kind of things, or was it their language so strident and broad as to cover any kind of a, uh, uh, a gathering or parade? It, it, it wasn't. Any type. It, it was, in fact, this was a, a pure speech type of thing. This was a, an instant where uh, a couple of environmental groups wanted to utilize a street for the express purpose of protesting. And so uh, it was a, a clear free speech type of thing. I think if there were other type of gatherings you wanted to gather to uh, and, and basically use some city property for a wedding or for a concert or something like that, then those restrictions would not be as, uh, as applicable. Or for a traditional parade, like we see parades, fair parade, Christmas parade. And, and, and you know, that's the thing. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's so hard, though, when you start, uh, you know, looking at that. Well, what's the traditional parade? Well, and, you just they, can't predict what those damn judges are going to do. They, they, well, yeah. And, and, and you don't know for sure, but, uh, but, but realistically, um, in, in this case, I, I think, you know, we should be relatively liberal in, in talking about these matters and uh, re just remember that it's probably just a cost of uh, having our Constitution being upheld. But I think we better move on to the public okay. hearing, Councilman, if um, you don't mind. But we'll, we'll have time said, for In discussion. essence, we can't do that. We can't be a, require being an also insured. Correct. Okay. Council will now listen to public comment. Public comments are... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I'm sorry. On a, on kind of a parallel issue. Uh, if we look at 107250, uh, it's line 69. The conduct of the parade is not. Re this is under issuance of permits. The conduct of the permit is not reasonably likely to cause a clear and present danger of injury to persons and property. And I think that somewhere along the line, there's got to be a judgment call. And I think that allows us the flexibility to look out for things that we might consider to be dangerous. So. Fair enough. Council will now listen to public comment. And again, public comments are limited to five minutes and no duplication of speakers, please. 
At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor of the issues involving parades to please approach the lectern. Is anyone here to speak in favor of this change to the parade ordinance? There being no one to speak in favor, I would now ask any of those individuals who would like to speak in opposition to the issues involving parades to please approach the lectern. Is anyone here to speak in opposition? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Council Pat Sweeney, 951 North Kimball. Um, I'm, I'm still against uh, the whole concept, but um, uh, in particular, um, I guess um, the insurance requirements on page 109 of the packet, um, which is within the um, not necessarily uh, the ordinance itself, but pertaining to the events guide. Um, uh, uh, I am curious, I, I agree in the paragraph, it says it is common for organizations such as nonprofits and for-profit corporations to carry, co carry comprehensive general liability insurance, but typically for, for those events, at least for the Downtown Business uh, uh, Association, um, you know, we, we've typically had to get extra insurance, um, in particular for the Christmas parade. Um, but I too would wonder what would happen um, if one of the garbage trucks broke loose uh, by chance, by accident. And I'm, I'm assuming the city's policy would kick in at that point um, uh, with their immunity clause and the $500,000 maximum payout um, would then kick in if that was uh, the error of the city. Uh, is, would that be correct in that? I assumption? would assume so. Mr. Henley, would you agree? Uh, again, it's a question of fact that would be, you know, not and insurance typically wouldn't be a part of that discussion, though I think most people know what's out there. So there would be just have to be a determination as to who is responsible for uh, the monitoring of the truck or whether someone uh, broke in unexpectedly or whether there was an unexpected type of uh, failure or uh, natural event that caused the, uh, the incident to happen. And then based upon that, you have a division in Wyoming. It's a, it's a situation where you have uh, comparative negligence. And so those, so anybody who uh, breached a duty of care which caused the injury may have some liability assessed against them by a jury or by a judge. And then the insurance, that's a, a different question as to who would be primary and who would be secondary. Typically, the person who owned the vehicle it would be primary. Okay. Um, Thank you for that, um, and uh, Mr. Mayor, on the page on page 110, it uh, states in closing again. Thank you for choosing Casper to hold your event. Uh, we look forward to helping you conduct a safe, successful event. I, frankly, I'm sorry, but I don't don't see this portion and the parade portion uh, very welcoming. Uh, to events, uh, just my opinion. Then I, I draw your attention to page 111 and 112 um, and 113 in the packet, which is parade fee and cost waiver. And um, I appreciate that this is in here, but if, if you review that um, and this becomes, if I decide that I want to uh, ask for a waiver on a parade and uh, subject myself to all of this different information requested um, about my personal financial status, no matter who I am. Um, and then this is part of public documents. And I just don't think we should be going there. Um, if there was a way to um, hold this within 
Um, I, maybe I'd find it less offensive, but uh, that's quite a amount of information. And then lastly, again, um, in, in your definitions, my last question would be, is Art Walk going to be considered um, a, a parade now? And would they be subject to these type of things? Um, should we be looking at uh, the downtown merchants? Should we be looking at Chocolate Walk, um, which we plan on uh, holding again this year? Is this uh, going to be considered um, a public gathering, a, a parade under under these rules and i just ask for clarification or and if you don't know the answer that's fine um uh, it, it's pretty obvious i think this is going to go through but and with that my time is up so it is thank you must wasn't watching it get it over here um do you have any thoughts on how we would handle the indigent applications mr sweeney i mean we have to be fair in, in a sense of we can't, I, anyone could claim they're indigent. Sure. And Mr. Mayor, I, uh, in council, um, I would just say, um, you know, if your intent is to um, truly take a look at the situation, do those documents have to become public? Um, and uh, that that would be my only question, but it it certainly appears from the application process <clears throat> that that's your intent, um, and um, so. Can you answer that, Mr. Henley? I, you know, I I do believe that they would be public documents. I don't think there's an exception for this under the Public Records Act. However, we did try to make these as innocuous as possible and to put in there, please don't put down your account numbers and that type of thing. And remember, these are for indigent people so the they can look before they apply to see if they're gonna qualify or not. And if they do qualify, they're not gonna have much information that's gonna be there because they're not gonna have many assets. Okay. I don't know who was first. Uh, uh, Councilman Huber. So, Mr. Henley, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that even if we put some language into this uh, guide that this information would be sealed and confidential, other aspects of state law would render that in, uh, ineffective? I, I'm, I believe that it would because then someone could say, well, how come they are deemed indigent but I applied and I was deemed not indigent. I have a right to see why they were and I'm not, just for a matter of fairness. So my guess is, is that we would probably be up against it there, that there would be no express way to get around that. Just be, because we deem it to be, or we label it such, I don't think that we can do that. Any other questions for Mr. Sweeney? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak in opposition to the changes to the parade ordinance? There being no others to speak for or against this item, I now declare the public hearing closed. Please read the ordinance by title only. An ordinance amending Article I on parades. Chair would entertain a motion to approve on first reading the ordinance just read. So moved. Second. Councilman, uh, moved by Councilman Pacheco, seconded by Vice Mayor Johnson. Discussion amongst council. Councilman Pacheco. Um, I, obviously, I'm going to support this um, ordinance, and, and I think it's good um, in multiple ways. But I'm, one area that I, I want to just to say why I'm happy we're doing this. Number one, I think we just need to continue to support our staff um, as they uh, are the front line um, for this. And so they're the ones that have to uh, go through the paperwork and, and deal with the, the, um, the public when it comes to this, those that are um, obviously uh, frustrated and so forth. And so they get the good and the bad and the ugly of it all. But I'm glad that we have um, both the special events guide and the parade ordinance um, that are working together. So everybody's, there's more of an equal um, playing field when it comes to um, pain um, and doing that. So we can kind of look at it in, in, a, in a very equitable way. Um, and I just want to reiterate one more time, we just need to continue to support our staff, um, especially when it comes to things like this. 
um, as it can be, I'm sure, um, daunting at times and frustrating. So I uh, just want to make sure that's clarified. Anyone else want to speak on this matter? Um, Mr. Pat isn't here this evening, but I guess I would like to, uh, even though he uh, brought some uncomfortable matters to our attention, it was his concerns that uh, caused us to take a good look at this, and hopefully we've left this in a we will have left this in a place that uh, will be uh, uh, more consistent, and um, and and that uh, and I hope Mr. Sweeney is wrong that the uh, public will find this to be a burdensome and uh, unreasonable, and we will find out over time, and if that's the case, we'll have a chance to address it again in the future. But I do know a lot of work went into this. And I'm particularly pleased that we addressed the free speech issues and the right of assembly issues that really uh, we didn't want, did, did not want to interfere with. And I think Count Vice Mayor Johnson brought some of those things to our attention as well. Any other discussion on the parade ordinance? Councilman Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, we've been at this a long time working on this thing. And with respect to the, the questions Mr. Sweeney asked, uh, those events that he mentioned, uh, the art walk and the chocolate walk, each particular business does something special that day. And therefore, I would argue they don't need a permit. It's no different than having a 4th of July sale or having, they're all over town, all different kinds of businesses, nor is it any different than having a, a Christmas candy walk or a, a walk at Halloween. Those people are certainly using the streets, but every individual business that participates uh, is an individual business. They're just coordinating their efforts on one day. And therefore, I would strongly argue that they, they do not require a, a permit in those, ap in those situations. Is that uh, everybody's reasonable understanding, or am I out in left field? I think the DCBA is the group that's sponsoring those events, and I would assume that they would need a permit since we're closing the streets. Well, if they want to close the street, but typically the chocolate walk and the art walk, they don't close streets. Okay. <laughs> I think we'll leave staff to interpret those things, <laughs> and we'll see through trial and error uh, how this all plays out. But I would encourage anyone that is considering an event to simply call city staff and ask that very question, and staff will tell them whether a permit is required. And if anyone is unhappy with the answer that they get, they can come here. The appeal procedure is very clear and we will take care of it in this room. Councilman Huber. Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to uh, <coughs> briefly here, there's been some concern about uh, parade ap permit applications, gathering applications that might be denied. Uh, I would particularly point everybody's attention to the uh, section in here that, that really it requires very specific findings, very specific. There are limited occasions when an application can be denied. It's not just a in the unfettered discretion of any official. And I would uh, just want to make sure that everybody out, out there appreciates that the city can't just willy-nilly be denying applications for, for no reason at all. There are very specific, narrow reasons that they can be denied. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Any amendments? Please cast your vote and please record the vote. Without members voting aye, motion passed. Thank you. Council will now discuss the ordinance for the creation of the Johnny J's edition. This item will be open for public. Oops, am I, did I skip something? Oh, I did. Sorry, I, went, I, I flipped the pages too quickly. My bad. I now declare the public hearing open for the consideration of the revised Historic Preservation Program rules and regulations. Mr. City Attorney, do you have exhibits? Mayor, we have three exhibits. Exhibit number one, correspondence from Liz Becker to J. Carter Napier, dated September 27, 2019. Exhibit number two, affidavit of publication is published in the Casper Star Tribune, dated August 2, 2019. And exhibit number three, affidavit of publication is published in the Casper Star Tribune, dated September 11, 2019. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of the Council, this is a request with regard to rescinding the notion of term limits, if you will, for this particular commission. The commission's concern is that it's hard to generate interest and keep that interest 
engaged and going over periods of time, particularly when uh, turnover is forced among this particular uh, special specialized group of individuals. And so the suggestion in your proposed ordinance is that that limitation on the number of terms be uh, removed. Thank you. Council will now listen to public comment. And again, public hearing comments are limited to five minutes. At this time, I would, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor of the rules and regulations changes to please approach the lectern. Is anyone here to speak in favor? Good evening. Connie Thompson Hall, 6224 Gothburg. And I am a member of the commission, and we do have existing commission members here with us tonight. We would appreciate um, you allowing us to have our term limits rescinded, as Mr. Napier commented. It is difficult. We are volunteers. We have passions about this preservation commission. This commission is not a voting commission, like the others that are involved in the city of Casper. And um, effective January of 2020, our commission <laughs> will lose half of its core. And um, we are supposed to stay off the commission for a year, and then we are allowed to come back, and we are really expressing our concern in losing that. So we would appreciate your decision to take away that part of our commission term to where we could stay on, or if something come up in our lives as life is so awesome, that we wouldn't be able to stay, we are allowed to go and somebody else can come in and take our position and just keep it open so that uh, we can collect more volunteers but yet not lose the, the heart of our commission. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Tros Trosper Hall. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak in favor of these changes to the regulations? There being no one else to speak in favor, is anyone here to speak in opposition to these changes? If there's no one else to speak for or against this, these changes to the Historic Preservation Program rules and regulations, I now declare the public hearing closed. Uh, let's see, where am I? The chair would entertain a motion to, by resolution, authorize the rules and regulations. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Huber, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. Any discussion amongst council? Councilman Huber. Mr. Mayor, I just think that it's important to note here, and uh, I'm certain that Mr. Henley or someone will correct me if I'm wrong, this commission is different from a lot of the other commissions. For instance, planning and zoning, that is a commission where citizens come there and that commission has the power to approve or deny things that that, that citizen might want to do. This commission, as I understand it, is more of an advisory kind of a thing and, and sits in sort of an advisory capacity. I think it's important just that everybody understands that. And if I misunderstand the role of that commission, I trust that someone will set me straight. But uh, okay. I think that's an important distinction. I think, I think you're correct. Other comments? Um, I would just like to express our, uh, my appreciation for those will, who are so willing to serve that they don't want to be termed out. And, uh, <laughs> and that is very, very impressive that you're that committed. It does also raise concerns, however, because we do have a, a citizenry here that uh, has a very volunteering nature. And uh, for anyone who is uh, watching uh, this evening, or reading these minutes at a later point in time, uh, we can always use more volunteers and the city manager keeps a list of people that are willing to serve on various boards and commissions uh, because we ask a lot of the people who are currently doing this work and sometimes they get tired and want a break and we need someone else to step up and do that. So uh, uh, sometimes it's easier to just, to, it's far too easy to just let someone else do the job. So I encourage people to step up and be involved because uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want this to be a trend where we have to uh, change rules and regulations because we can't find replacements and uh, need to have the same, same people serve indefinite, indefinitely, much as I appreciate their willingness to do so. Any other discussion? Any amendments? 
Please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. Okay, now I'm on the right page. <clears throat> Council will now discuss the ordinance for the creation of the Johnny Jays edition. This item will be open for public comment and for discussion by Council. Please read the ordinance on third reading by title only. An ordinance approving a vacation replat subdivision agreement and zone change creating the Johnny Jays edition subdivision. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion to on third reading the, to, to approve on third reading the ordinance just read. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Mayor Johnson, seconded by Councilman Kathy. Council will now listen to pu public comment. Is anyone here this evening to speak on the Johnny Jays edition? Apparently not. Any discussion amongst council? Any amendments from council? If not, please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. <clears throat> Thank you. The council will now discuss the ordinance amending the municipal code pertaining to trees and shrubs. This item will also be open for public comment and for discussion by council. Please read the ordinance on second reading by title only. An ordinance amending chapter 12.32 of the Casper Municipal Code. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion to approve on second reading the ordinance just read. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Pacheco, seconded by Councilman Friel. Council will now listen to public comment. And again, public comments are limited to five minutes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Barbara Derby, and I live at 4713 Mountain Way. And my father was George Corrales, that, uh, the man that got killed. Um, I am recently having uh, landscaping work done at my home, and uh, I was out talking to a bricklayer at my house, and I asked him a scenario. I said, if you wanted, say, let's just say you're tired of laying bricks and you want to stay in the same business, but you want to go cut down trees for a living, and I said, so you want to go and get a license and the license requires that you have three years of training and then you have to um, assume uh, two or three million dollars in uh, insurance and he said first off he said that would deter me from doing it he said because um, I think everybody should carry the insurance, but three years, he said, I'm not in for that. So he felt like um, that is something he would be deterred from just to go get the license. Um, I do agree that this is not going to stop everybody, but if it just stops one person from going out there and doing this to prevent what happened to my dad, I think it's well worth the ordinance. Just if it just stops one person from hurting another. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Derby. And again, we are sorry for your loss. We saw the photos, they were horrible. And uh, clearly this what we're doing this evening is an attempt to prevent that. Well, as some of you know, as uh, Mr. Kathy knows, I used to check him out at Safeway all the time. I know a lot of people in this town, a lot. I was born and raised here, never have left. I mean, I'm not leaving. Um, my dad, born and raised here, never has lived anywhere else but Casper. I've talked to a lot of people, and they are absolutely shocked that this tree ordinance has not, you know, something isn't being done. And they feel, I've talked to just numerous people. I mean, I'm retired, I'm out and about, spending my retirement, <laughs> and I can't, um, people are absolutely shocked 
that these guys didn't have insurance and everything like that. But I think if it would just deter one person from going out there and harming one other person, I think it's well worth it. And so do they. I, they're, they're absolutely shocked. And so I, when I tell them about it, the ordinance, they say, yeah, I, I think we need that ordinance. I've had a lot of people tell me that. So. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Derby? Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Is anyone else here to speak on this ordinance? Any discussion amongst council? Any amendments? Please cast your vote on second reading. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Oops, sorry. We do have some. I guess I will sponsor these amendments. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so I, I would propose to amend um, for gender neutrality just so that it reads um, gender neutral. We have to do them separate, correct? Uh, yeah. Mr. Hanley, are we following the rules here? Okay. It wasn't a public yeah. hearing. It's okay. Okay, so basically all we're doing with this change is using gender neutral language in the ordinance. There's no, no other substantial changes. I can I can read it really quick. Okay, on pages I'm oh, sorry, on page six, lines twelve and thirteen. On page six, lines 19 and 20. On page seven, lines one through three. On page seven, line eight. On page seven, line 28. And on page eight, lines eight through 11. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Pacheco. Discussion on the amendment. If there's no discussion, please cast your vote on the amendment. And please record the vote. With all voting aye, motion to amend passed. Any other amendments? Any other discussion on the original? All right, this? well, I'll take this one as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would propose that we amend it on page five, paragraph A, to, I believe, add the wording in the beginning of the paragraph to say, except as provided in code section 12.32.110 abutting property owners. Oh, thank you. So what, uh, what line are you on? Um, I apologize. It's page five, paragraph A. I don't have a line reference. There's two paragraphs. A. It says 12.32.080. Oh, yep. Do you want the amendment? A. So we're adding that language to the end of the of the of, uh, to the end of A. To the beginning of A. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Kathy. Perhaps a discussion to explain, if you don't mind, or someone to explain. <laughs> I, uh, Vice Mayor Johnson. I guess I, I just have a question about it. So this includes the trees that are. The property owner's responsibility yet are on city property, correct? Yes. Basically, we wanted to make sure that uh, the property owner had the option to uh, go out and have either the property owner or his family or her family uh, trim the trees, uh, prune the trees that were on the uh, the the. Mediums. Parkways, I think, is what we've I called them it, in yeah, the past. The and uh, as long as it was abutting their property, they could do that. They need not get a permit. So we just wanted to make sure that that was clear. There seemed there was a little bit of a give and take there between a couple of the provisions, and this just clarifies that they're they're uh, permitted to do that. The area between the sidewalk and the and the owner's property, correct? Or in the sidewalk and the street. That's correct. Yep. So they can't remove the tree if they decide they don't want to take care of it. 
they, they, they could uh, seek a permit and get the permit, uh, make the application for the permit, but they can't do that just on their own. Okay. They could trim it. Correct. But not on their own. It has to be, they can't go trim it themselves or they can? They can. Yeah, they can trim and prune themselves, but to either uh, replace it or remove it, they would have to get a permit. Because that would be considered an aerial operation. Well, no, actually, just because it's it would be this, you know, basically the city's property, and in looking at that, you've got certain requirements as to where they're placed. They're not too close to the curb, not too close to an intersection, things of that nature. That clear to everyone? We've had the, the motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion on the amendment? Please cast your vote on the amendment. <coughs> and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion to amend passed. Okay, now back to the original ordinance. Um, any other discussion on the amended ordinance? Councilman Mr. Huber? Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to. Uh... I was concerned that uh, it didn't seem to me that it was, I always forget to turn that on. I was concerned because it didn't seem to me that this was sufficiently clear that it did not impede private property owners from uh, doing whatever they wanted to with their own trees on their own private property. Uh, Mr. Henley, could you explain to everybody and to the record here what you explained to me briefly about that delayed my concerns in that regard. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Councilman. Um, the, the ordinance itself doesn't address uh, private property um, except as to the uh, specifics as to uh, the distance between the sidewalk and where you can plant a tree, the distance between where a tree can be and the uh, the end of it. There are very few references to that. So the ordinance by its own terms does not apply to private property and what a private property owner can do on his or her own property. However, um, in the ordinance itself, um, there is a reference to the the uh, the reason for the ordinance, which is basically to uh, to address the licensing, uh, uh, so professional uh, arborists. And if you remember, that's why the uh, the ordinance uh, was originally amended because of Barb and her family were here, and and there was concern about the regulations reg requiring arborists. And this is really the ordinance that addresses those arborists. And so it talks about. Um, and I'm trying to shuffle through these and find the, the right section. It talks about the, uh, the responsibility. And uh, if you go to section 1232.90, it talks about uh, the arborist responsibility and then the provisions that apply to licensee operation, and that's in paragraph B. And that's where it starts talking about that you must have an ISA certified arborist on location at all times during an aerial operation, and the safety measures must be utilized. So it, that applies just to uh, licensees, not to property owners. And there's really nothing in there that would say that this would apply to a property owner as far as them trimming or tr uh, uh, felling their own trees. Follow Vice Mayor Johnson. So I could still enlist the help of my family and friends and go do all that myself without a license. You can, and, and you can even have family help you with the, with the, uh, the uh, city's easements if, if you want. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Does anyone want, want to make an amendment? And you feel like that's satisfactory? Okay. Are we ready to cast our votes then on the amended ordinance? Please cast your vote. And please record the vote. With Council Members Bates, Kathy, and Johnson voting nay, motion passed. Thank you. Council will now discuss the ordinance amending the municipal code to establish a code of ethics. This item will be open for public comment and for discussion by Council. Please read the ordinance on second reading by title only. An ordinance amending Casper Municipal Code to establish a code of ethics. Chair would entertain a motion to approve on second reading the ordinance just read. So moved. 
Second. Moved by Councilman Cathy, seconded by Vice Mayor Johnson. Council will now listen to public comment. Is anyone here this evening to discuss the code of ethics? Any discussion amongst council? Any amendments? Please cast your vote and please record the vote. All members voting aye, motion passed. You must have done a good job, Mr. Henley, writing that. Please read the consent resolutions by title only. Are we removing one of them? We're going to do that after they're read. Neat. Don't we need to do we, don't we read them all first? Okay. Okay. Item 11A1, adopting the revised special event guide. Item 11A2, a license agreement with Visionary Broadband for fiber optic cable. Item 11A3, the amendment number two with civil engineering professionals for the zone three water system. Item 11A4, pre-application submittal for a loan with the Wyoming State Loan and Investment Board for the North Platte Sanitary Sewer Interceptor, Interceptor Rehabilitation Project. Item 11A5, accepting a deed from Eastgate Ranch for 9.21 acres. Item 11A6, accepting a deed from Eastgate Ranch for 1.49 acres. Item 11A7, accepting a deed from Granite Peak Development for 23.49 acres. Item 11A8, accepting a deed from Natrona Land Holdings for 9.62 acres. Item 11A9, adopting a memorandum of understanding with Friends of Hogadon for night skiing. Item 11A10, agreement with Casper Amateur Hockey Club for use of a modular building attached to the ice arena. Item 11A11, amending the optional 1% number 15 agreement with the Platte River Trails Trust. Item 11A12, amending the optional 1% number 15 agreement with the Central Wyoming Senior Services. Item 11A13, releasing the skate park from the lease agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of Central Wyoming. Item 11A14, a contract with Nelson Nygaard for the Mills Main Street Corridor Main Street Corridor Study, and Item 11A15, Increasing the City Manager's Purchasing Authority. The Chair would entertain a motion to remove Item 11A9 from the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Cathy, seconded by Councilman Hopkins, and just by way of explanation, the Friends of Hogadon are not uh, completed, have not completed their review of the document. So we will handle that at a later date. The chairman would entertain a motion to adopt the consent resolutions just read no, with... We need to vote on the removal. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion to remove item A, 11A9. So moved. You've read the motion and seconded. Ah, okay. We just need to vote. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Please cast your vote on the removal. Please record the vote. All members voting aye. Motion passed. Okay. Now the chair would entertain a motion to adopt the remaining consent resolutions just read. Table. So moved. Moved by Councilman Cathy. Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Johnson. Anything you'd like to discuss, Mr. City Manager, on any of these items this evening? Okay. Any abstentions or nay votes? Please cast your vote. Please record the vote. All members voting aye. Motion passed. Chair would now entertain a motion to uh, place the item 11A9 on the agenda for, I'm sorry, the date would be Mr. City Manager. 11-5. Thank you. For November 5th. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Mayor Johnson, seconded by Councilman Cathy. Please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. Thank you. Please re read the consent minute action titles. Item 12A1, the purchase of a mini skid steer and attachments from Vermeer of Colorado. Item 12A2, the purchase of seven Zoll auto pulse systems for use by the fire EMS department. Chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent minute action agenda items just read. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Friel, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. <clears throat> Any abstentions or nay votes? Please cast your vote and please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passed. At this time, we ask council members to bring forward relevant concerns or items of interest or reports on meetings. Uh, let's start with Councilman Pacheco. 
Uh, nothing really. I just want to uh, bring to the attention, I have lost my placard. <laughs> oh, there it is. My concerns have been alleviated. We don't need an investigation. <laughs> Councilman Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to note that uh, with reference to the uh, event guide and the issue that Mr. Sweeney brought up about the uh, financial thing, questions that we ask people in the indigency portion of that, uh, but for the city attorney's uh, advice that <clears throat> state statutes wouldn't make that confidential, even if we tried to, uh, I would have been proposing that we maintain that information in a confidentiality. I was reluctant and didn't want to try to insert any language in there that might imply to someone that, oh, this is going to be confidential, when in fact state statutes would have abrogated that. So I was, I was, puzzled, I was troubled by that, but we're stuck with what the uh, state statutes require there. And so uh, that's why I didn't do anything about that. But thank you for listening to me vent about that. Anything else? Councilman Freel? Nothing. Vice Mayor Johnson? Nothing. <clears throat> Councilman Hopkins? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to bring up the, the tree ordinance and the licensing of the arborists. Uh, I, I think we've done a good job with this, and I agree with the folks that were here. I happen to work with George Corrales off and on for 30 years. Uh, when he was a machinist or a mechanic for Wyoming Machinery. This guy would go out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of winter and work safely by himself on a machine that was broken down. He knew safety. He was a, he was a good man and quite honestly one of the best mechanics I ever knew. And I think we would have been doing a big disservice in his honor had we not passed this tonight. I just wanted the family to know that, that I appreciate all the work that George did for us. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Councilman Cathy. I think <coughs> nothing tonight. I'm sorry. Councilwoman Lutz. Nothing tonight. Councilman Bates. Nothing. A couple things for me. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind people that tomorrow is Coffee with a Cop Day. And there are three locations, actually four. Um, one is at Blue Ridge Coffee, first thing in the morning, 6.30 till 7.30. Then at the Casper College Union Building from 9 to 10. And then later at Metro Coffee from 5 to 6. The fourth one is in Evansville at It's a Grind from 7 to 8. And uh, I'd just like to say a couple things about the uh, trip to Washington, D.C. that uh, several of us, of us took the uh, week before last, uh, City Manager Napier, myself, uh, Council, uh, excuse me, um, um, Mr. Hendry from the, the, the uh, county, uh, two of our CADA officers, uh, and uh, Councilwoman... Uh, Ives from Mills and the uh, Office of Public Works uh, Director Kevin. Uh, oh man, I'm having trouble with names tonight. Kevin O'Hearn, thank you. Uh, and we all went out to Washington, D.C. Uh, because uh, we are very seriously pursuing some grant monies uh, now that the opportunity zones have been defined and, um, and, and our. Our pro, uh, primary objective was to uh, enhance the likelihood that our grant application for the completion of Midwest Avenue would be approved, which is going to cost us close to $2 million just to complete those last two blocks between uh, Walnut and Poplar. And we believe we had, uh, we received some significant support from our delegation, uh, Congresswoman Cheney and Senators Brasso and Enzi, all gave us very positive reactions to our request and we believe that their support may play a critical role in getting that grant application approved. We were also supportive of the Mills effort to build their project along the river uh, which involves both the EPA and the surface and uh, the Office of Surface and Lands. I don't remember. I'm pretty close. But any, <laughs> and, uh, and so all, all of these grant monies, we all pay our federal taxes, and uh, it's important for us to take our opportunities to uh, obtain those funds when those grant opportunities are there. And uh, I think we've worked very effectively as a team and, uh, and hopefully we will be successful. Um, these infrastructure changes will create uh, 
many opportunities for private developers to then step up and take advantage of the capital gains relief that they can achieve through uh, development in these opportunity zones. Our job is to create the infrastructure to make that possible. And, um, and, and we think that uh, this could really set the stage for some very significant developments in the old Yellowstone uh, district area uh, for us to get the street completed. So we're excited about that and uh, it was time well spent. And uh, with that, the next meetings of the, of the City Council will be a work session to be held at 4.30 p.m. Tuesday, October 8th, 2019 in the Council Meeting Room and a regular Council Meeting to be held at 6 p.m. Tuesday, October 15th, 2019 in the Council Chambers. A notice of an executive session to take place at this date and during this meeting was given. We have a matter to discuss regarding security. Therefore, the chair would entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session and at the conclusion of that executive session to reconvene this meeting solely for the purpose of adjournment of this regular meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Huber, seconded by Councilman Friel. There being a majority of members present and a motion to adjourn into executive session having been moved and seconded and that motion requiring a two-thirds majority of the council present, please cast your vote. A greater than two-thirds majority of council present voted in favor of the motion. We are hereby adjourned into an executive session. <laughs>